I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome back to Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. This is the second week of our Adam Sandler theme month, mm-hmm. and we had kind of decided we were going to alternate back and forth between serious and comedic movies. Okay. And so we started off with Billy Madison, and tonight we just finished watching the 2002 film Punch Drunk Love. Indeed. Directed and written by Paul Thomas Anderson. Yay! A favorite of Nate's. Why don't you tell me about your... Not first reactions, because you've seen this before, but tell me perhaps about the first time you did see this, first thoughts and reactions to it, and then how long it's been since you've seen it and kind of reactions okay. tonight. So this is bas- basically my selection for the month, the one that I uh, lobbied heavily for. I first saw this film in 2008. This is only the second time I've seen this. Really? Yeah. I'm a little bit surprised. I, I have very fond memories of it, and they were confirmed tonight. I, I really enjoyed uh, revisiting it. It is not a movie for everybody, but there are things in it that just really resonate with me. I think that this, this is really the first time Adam Sandler was doing something other than Adam Sandler. And he, in a way, revealed more of himself than I think we'd seen in a film before. And there's always been this kind of anger thing, often played off as stick in, in Adam Sandler comedies. But he probes that, and he plays this character in this film, Barry Egan, who runs a small business in Thousand Oaks, California area. It's never entirely clear what they do. They appear to make or sell plungers. At least that's one of the things they're involved with. They're in a little... Not even a strip mall. It's it's uh, like, it's a, like a little industrial district, park. Yeah. yeah, there's an auto mechanic shop just down the street, and he is a frustrated, lonely man. He had seven sisters growing up that teased him endlessly. Endlessly, even though uh, at least some of them, particularly uh, Mary Lynn Raskbab, has some real affection for him and want, wants what's best for him. Kind of. Kind of. Because even she gives him even crap. Even she, she gives him crap, but she gives him... Well, that, that conversation, it's like, well, he's not that weird. He's well, my she, brother. I could think he's But weird. she also bullies him. Like, when she, she first brings Lena to, to his workplace, mm-hmm. you know, and she's like, I'm going to go out to the car, and then she comes back and is like, you know, she just bullies him. Yeah. Like everyone else. Yeah, he's such a frustrated guy. And the basic plot is this woman, Lena, is introduced to him a co-worker of his sister, Mary Lynn's, who saw a photograph of him and just decided something about him, spoke to her and wanted to to meet him. And so the sister tried to set him up, and he seems like he turns down as a matter of course any attempt to set him up because he's just so extremely socially awkward. But they end up clicking. They kind of have this dance around each other, and uh, they go on a date. But before that, lonely at home one night, he calls a, uh, a line, a telephone sex telephone line. Telephone sex line. line. At fr- it seems like he's re- like like the the ad that he sees is to talk to beautiful women, and I think he really wants to talk to women. I think that's his principal thing. Now he ends up going for it after. Well, a while I think at the, the time he just wanted to talk to someone because yeah. he's previously asked his brother-in-law to to help him find someone to talk to. And when that guy turned around on him and, and his brother-in-law tells his sister, which upsets him, that he just wants to talk to anyone and he doesn't want to involve anyone else. So yeah. he sees this ad where he can call and talk to him. And so he's like, well, I'm just going to pay a shrink. I'll just pay the phone. He's a, he's a guy who can't seem to keep secrets. Everything gets outed on him. And he's a guy that talks around. He's got this scheme, this side scheme, because there's a tie-in between an airline and this pudding company. And he realizes that if you buy the pudding in bulk, you're actually going to get more than the pudding's worth, like a great deal more than the pudding's worth in frequent flyer miles. So he's trying to game the system. And he talks on his date with Lena. Lena, you know, it's like, it's like they don't read the fine print, you know, it's on them. I'm, you know, taking advantage of the system. But he is so incredibly easily taken advantage of when he, when he, dials the sketchy phone sex line, even yep. gives them the social security number. Yeah. It's like the stupidest thing you could do. And that's actually based on a true story though. Yeah. And you know, the the pudding thing. The pudding thing. Yeah. It was based on a true story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But keep going. Anyway, these these people that run this this line, phone sex line, are 
trying to scam. He cancels the credit card almost immediately after. So they end up sending four guys in a pickup truck to force him to give them money. And it's all run by Philip Seymour Hoffman out of the back of a mattress and furniture store in Provo, Utah. Yeah. And he sends four blonde guys from Provo, Utah. They all appear to be related in some capacity. Well, it says that they're four brothers in, mm. at one point in the movie. Well, and th- but his connection to them, oh, it, yeah. it, it feels like there's some kind of uh, yeah. familial connections there. It's, uh, you know, Adam, Philip Seymour Hoffman is an actor who never repeats himself. Like, this is just a complete, like, we've never seen anybody quite like this guy before. We'll never see anybody quite like him again. He's this weird kind of lord of a very small kingdom that's, that's very full of himself and has these weird kind of quasi-ethical things where it's like, well, they're perverts, so I can, I can take advantage of them, and that's fine. I don't know if I read these characters as being LDS. I don't particularly do, but I think there might be some commentary there about certain business practices. <laughs> it's just so out of left field. So much of this movie is just out of left field. It's such a unique movie, and... I was just completely charmed by it the first time I saw it. I was charmed by it again. It's just this, it occupies this really unique space, and and there's basically two storylines going on. There's him dealing with the fallout of the the phone sex call, and him just falling head over heels for Emily Watson's uh, Lena. And she makes a, a comment that she has to go to Hawaii for business. And so he follows her to Hawaii and in this is a guy who doesn't take risk is ma- taking this making this grand romantic gesture taking risk fighting back against the the evil Utah cabal yeah. and I just I just love this movie it, it just uh, really speaks to me I'm, I'm not as socially awkward as Adam Sandler in this film but I have some I can relate to a certain extent to that yeah what the, are your thoughts of this movie the first time that I saw this movie I actually didn't particularly love it hmm I felt as though his familiar relation, familial relationships, the way they treat him was just so off-putting. Mm. And then he's in turn so awkward and has these anger issues that kind of stem from that. That it, for me, it just didn't click the first time. Like the, the romance and the quirkiness of it mm. didn't overpower it. But then you liked it so much, and I was kind of surprised by how much you liked it. I rewatched it, mm. and on second viewing, it was a little bit less off-putting. I don't know why. Mm. But tonight I found it to be fairly charming. Yeah. I have not seen nearly as many Paul Thomas Anderson films as you have, mm-hmm. but thus far this is my, my the favorite of the ones that I've yeah, seen. Yeah. So. I would probably say it's top three or four for me. So, I mean, it's like I said, it is. it does have a certain charm. There's elements of it that are just a little bit awkward and a little bit off-putting, and I'm not entirely sure why it comes across that way because it doesn't seem like that is normally how Tom, Paul Thomas Anderson puts his films together well he he he's a very diverse filmmaker i mean he, he i mean this this film really isn't particularly like anything else he did I, I think maybe hard eight one of his first films might be the closest to it and the whole thousand oaks that that kind of valley area of california i don't know my california ge- geography very good but this speaks of where he's from i love the kind of rundownness of where this business is located. There's this building across the street that has that really awkward kind of '70s architecture to it. I love, I love that. I love the randomness of it. I love the freaking harpsichord or whatever it is that is uh, dropped yeah. off, and you just it's like, well, I want to take it. And and how people keep hurting themselves throughout the movie in the background. There's that car accident that he witnesses at the beginning. There's uh, multiple forklift accidents at his warehouse. At one point, Louis Guzman is his number two. His chair just falls apart when he's sitting in it for no reason. Did it fall apart? Or I thought he was tipping back. And uh, I might have been tipping back. But yeah. There's a really funny deleted scene. It's probably on YouTube where Philip Seymour Hoffman is filming a commercial for his uh, mattress shop. Have you seen this? No. And he's supposed to jump off of the building onto a big stack of mattresses that he does and then he falls immediately off the side <laughs> and there's a weird visual thing they do with these lights that kind of kind of morph around a few times as transitions in the, in the oh, film oh you're talking the scene changes yeah the scene yeah. changes yeah and, and there are a few within the movie there's a few scenes where lights turn on and off yeah. as things occur 
like when he is talking to Lena when he first gets to Hawaii, he's in the phone booth, and when he's talking to his sister, the lights are off in the phone booth. Mm. And even when he first starts talking to Lena... and Well, he call, he calls trying to get her in the hotel, gets the wrong room. Yeah. And then when he calls again and gets her, then the light pops on the, yeah. the phone booth. In the phone booth, booth. Yeah. 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 And they do that also in one of the office scenes and one of the scenes at his house. Mm. So the, it occurs a few times throughout the movie. One thing that caught me off guard about this movie, one thing that I hadn't been aware of until we got into this month, do you know what the budget for this film was? No. I had, the even all the way through tonight, I had assumed this was a relatively small budget film. Yeah, yeah. $25 million. $25 million. And this would have probably been shot in 2001. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot for, for, for that. Yeah, and for, for the movie that it is. But kind of jumping ahead a little bit, do you know how this did in the box office? I do not. It did not make its money back. Yeah, I would have Though it was actually, it was actually fairly close. It was actually short by not a lot. So I assume through streaming rights, DVD sales, all that type of stuff, it has since made up the difference. But its opening weekend domestically was a mere three hundred and sixty-seven thousand mm-hmm. dollars. Its U.S. gross was seventeen point eight million dollars. With a worldwide gross of twenty four point six million dollars, mm. off of that twenty five million dollar budget. Uh, it's a film that has indie written all over it. It's, it's very yeah. much like I said, DVD sales, streaming rights. It's it's made it's, it's made the money back since then. Yeah. So you have other thoughts before we do trivia? Go ahead, and we can do some trivia. At one point, Adam Sandler is being followed by the Steadicam as he talks on the phone. During one take, the front of the camera accidentally bumped into a table and knocked the camera briefly causing the shot to jump from Sandler to an image of an out-of-focus piece of the set, then quickly readjust. Paul Thomas Anderson loved the effect and wanted to do it again, so the crew did more takes, and right at the same point in the dialogue, they smacked the front of the matte box on the camera to reproduce the effect. During the scene where Barry Egan is at the supermarket looking for the cheapest, healthiest choice food item, he is being followed by an out-of-focus character in a red outfit. Did you notice that? Oh, I did not. It's Lena Leonard before they've been introduced. Oh. So she's seen his picture and she's been following him for a while. Because yeah. she also figured out where he worked and like the mechanic nearby as a ruse to meet him before she got introduced. Is this weird mutual stalker thing yeah. that pans out. That's slightly disturbing. Yeah. A subplot of the fil- film was inspired by an article in Time magazine about David Phillips, a University of California civil engineer who stumbled upon a lucrative frequent flyer promotion. By purchasing 12,150 cups of Healthy Choice Pudding for just $3,000, he accumulated 1.25 air miles. Million. 1.25 million air miles. Well, two things about Paul Thomas Anderson. He deliberately wanted to make a very different film after the rigors of making Magnolia in 1999. He felt he had reached a dead end with his previous multi-character movies, and he also wanted to subvert the critics' expectation of his film. Mm-hmm. Then Paul Thomas Anderson announced that his follow-up to Magnolia uh, would be an Adam Sandler comedy at a, <laughs> at a press conference at the Cannes Film Festival. The news was greeted with laughter by the assembled press, much like Nate. When Punch Drunk Love eventually played at Cannes, Anderson won the Best Director Award and was nominated for the festival's top prize, the Palme d'Or. Uh, d'Or. Months later, Sandler was nominated for a Golden Globe in the musical or comedy category. Paul Thomas Anderson has referred to this film as a art house Adam Sandler film. Yeah, that works. Yeah. It passes the smell test. During a prom- promotional interview for Magnolia, a British journalist asked writer and director Paul Thomas Anderson which actors he would like to work with in the future. Anderson replied that he would like to work with Adam Sandler and Daniel Day Lewis. The journalist believed Anderson was joking because the actors are from such different backgrounds and have very different acting styles. However, Anderson's next two films did indeed feature these two actors in the lead roles, this film film starring Sandler and then There Will Be Blood starring Daniel Day-Lewis. As of 2021, Anderson is the only director to have worked with both actors. (laughs) And I don't know if there was any overlap between these two, but Paul Thomas Anderson is married to Maya Rudolph. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't know if they were on Saturday Night Live at all. I think Sandler probably left around the time Rudolph came on the cast. Yeah, that's interesting. So when Barry punches the wall in his office, mm-hmm. when he goes back to his desk and he sets his hand down on the desk, did you notice anything on his knuckles? Uh, yeah, I couldn't quite make it out. 
So it, the, the his knuckles are cut, but the cuts in his knuckles spell the word love. Ah. Because that's when he starts doing things out of love instead of strictly anger. Mm. The four blonde brothers who muscle Barry are played by four actual brothers. The first Adam Sandler movie to get a positive review from movie critic Roger Ebert. <laughs> Oh, did you realize that much of the score of this movie is played on a harmon- harmonium, which is the Makes instrument sense. that he picks up? Yeah, I really I like the music in this, and there's there's some old love song that they play, "He Needs Me," which I've heard somewhere else before, which is really appropriate here, and that combined with some of the visual sense makes me think uh, this feels French. This movie feels French to me. I, I could see a version of this movie where the love interest is Audrey Tattoo. Yeah, I could too. At 95 minutes, this is the shortest film that Paul Thomas Anderson has written and directed. Yeah, I think that's about all that I wanted to share out of those. So, Well, I, obviously I quite like this film. Critics generally did this as a 79% on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's an acquired taste film, but it did manage to eke out a 7.3 on IMDb. Yeah, and its Metacritic score is 78, which is very similar to its uh, Rotten Tomatoes score. So, any other closing thoughts on this? No. How would you rate it? Ah, we need to rate it, yes. I am going to rate it 3.5 on the 4-star scale and 8 on the 10. I'm going to go an even 3 and 8. Oh, okay. So, but we're in the, in the same ballpark on this one. Mm. So it's like I said, like you said, it's there's aspects of this that could be considered a, an acquired taste. It is rated R for language and, and some violence, but it, it, the quirkiness works. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's really its own thing. Yeah, and it's the thing that uh, clicked with me. Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know that Adam Sandler says a comedic line in this movie, or at least not in the final edit. Yeah. So yeah. Well, if there's nothing else, I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And this is Rob and Nate record a podcast. Brought to you by Healthy Choice Pudding. There was one other, Carl's Jr., Philip Seymour Hoffman, the first time that he's on screen, mm-hmm. he's drinking from a... A Carl's Jr. And he wrote, yeah. like shows it and, t- and then twists it back. When he's in that like restaurant scene, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, you going to go buy some pudding now? I have some pudding at home, actually. It's interesting that the Healthy Choice Pudding that he buys, he only buys chocolate. Luis Guzman, I liked him in this movie. Yeah, there's that scene where he, he's, tr- he's trying to do code for get me out of this, but we need to talk to that guy in Toledo. And this is confusing, Luis Guzman. What guy in Toledo? Is this the guy at the, well, the, 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 the Ramada? Ramada, or something? yeah. And he just gives him this look like, something's up. Well, yeah. Yeah, and he just wants to please him, but like it's it's like getting to him because he comes in and he's like genuinely flustered. He's like, he's like upset. Like, about it. He's, he's like, yeah, it's like I'm missing Ooh. something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That that opening scene where he's just under that single light in the warehouse. Mm-hmm. That's kind of an interesting way to shoot that. So yeah. that desk doesn't appear again the rest of the movie. Oh, right. not in that oh, corner question. like that. So yeah, you've only seen this twice. Yeah. How have you only seen this twice? Uh, I've. I don't know. Yeah. I and Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. I thought you would have seen this more than this that. This was the one that it's like now that I've rewatched this, I feel like I might be able to compose a like a ranking. Uh-huh. Cuz I it was not fresh enough in my mind, but it's definitely near the top. Yeah. Could you do this for the 5-day challenge? I suppose I could, but it probably wouldn't be You need high to do the 5-day challenge sooner than later. Yeah. That should be your summer goal is pick pick a week and do the 5-day challenge. I'll have to do that. 